Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Horn Call podcast. My name is James Bolden. I'm the publications editor for the International Horn Society and your host. Today on this episode and for next month's episode, we're going to do uh, something a little bit different rather than have our usual guests come on. I thought it might be fun to share some archival recordings from quite early in the IHS's history. This is from the very first, uh, at the time, what was called the International Horn Workshop, uh, now known as the IHS uh, Symposium. This is from a talk that John Barrows gave at this uh, first annual French Horn Workshop at Florida State University in 1969. Uh, He talks about a whole bunch of different kinds of things, his philosophy on playing, uh, ideas about instruments and mouthpieces. Uh, I think you're going to really enjoy hearing this voice from the past. So I hope you enjoy hearing a masterclass by John Barrows. Well, let's play this scale, let's play this scale. And somebody says, well, now, I just can't play this high. This is after two weeks, maybe. I can't get up to third space C. So I have them demonstrate, because we do a lot of teaching of each other. And they demonstrate, and sure enough, they can't. I say, okay, here. And I reach into the drawer, and I say, take this mouthpiece, put it in your horn, and let's see what you can do. Play a C major scale. And they start out, and much their major, they go up to C and back. You know, I can't believe it. Wow, wow, wow. Well, what it is, is a Holton mouthpiece, and I'm recommending it carte blanche. It's a, it's a Farkas model, which I have never particularly liked, except when Farkas played it. <laughs> but it's called a Farkas DC, and I don't think, I don't think Phil ever blew on it in his life. <laughs> I don't think it means direct current, I think it means deep, deep cup. It's a Holton mouthpiece, it says Farkas, it says Farkas DC. I've got one here. I'll pass it around if you lock the door. Nothing. It's, this is an absolutely professional model mouthpiece. You run it around if anybody wants to look at it. They may have one downstairs in display. Probably not. I don't, they, don't, they should push that mouthpiece like gangbusters. I've gotten rid of some of my fifth dozen since I found out about this. Oh, you've got one. Fine. Now, I have had a couple of students who they don't work out for no mouthpiece is perfect but it's unbelievable you show this one kid she can play a C major scale hey you got another one sure oh they all turn in their mouthpieces and they all get these to try out for the other four or five weeks and it it I'd say without exception it improves a beginner group 50% just like that they play 50% better they get a better tone they get higher they get lower they get louder they get softer everything now it's it's just simply this that Many of the manufacturers think that they can lure you. You're a bad trumpet player, so I'm going to make a horn player out of you. So the first thing I do is to get somebody to make a mouthpiece which as closely resembles a trumpet mouthpiece as I can, hoping that you won't notice that this is a horn you're playing on. Well, unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. Because someone will surely tell you this isn't a trumpet anyway, and, and the mouthpiece like that won't play a horn well. So you labor and flounder around, sounding like death warmed over, and finally you give up, you know, because, you know, it just doesn't work out. This is, this is a honest to goodness professional French horn mouthpiece. It's a very thin rim. If you push, if you tell your kids not to use pressure, you use pressure with that and you, you'll know why you're not supposed to use pressure. Because it hurts. <laughs> so you won't use pressure. <laughs> You tell the kids you've got to blow, and you'll find out why. Because you, in spite of the fact that that's a 14 drill in there, it's a deep cut. You've got to you've got to generate some power to get into that thing. Yeah. Well, why do you not start the now? Well, I, I do this. I, this is first of all, these kids are never going to play horn again. But it's a good demonstration. They're all going to teach, and it, I like it comes up by itself. I, mean, I could start them out on this, and and uh, they wouldn't realize how bad a bad mouthpiece is. These are all potential teachers in the junior or senior year, most of them. I want them to get a, a shocking experience, something they'll really remember, so they'll care instead of just giving a kid any old thing that happens to be in a box. Here's a mouthpiece. That's how I started. That's how all of us started. You waste half of your life, you know, fumbling around on some dumb thing. I think, I think a thin rim is a very indicated thing. I think the, the tendency, the present tendency towards 
The excessively large throat is ridiculous because I think very few players have the strength of embouchure. Jimmy Chambers does, people like that. He can play on a mouthpiece, he can drop a lead pencil right through, but he's got some chops to go with it. And the average high school kid or college kid does not have that kind of strength to control the, the, the horn at this end and stick that into an 8D, which is the only thing anyone does nowadays, with that huge valve, you've lost half the control at this end of the horn, and you're really just playing sound. You're not center, You're not able to center anything. And I've heard some of the most spectacular playing, Vern Reynolds, for example, plays an 8D. I would never, I would never guess if they played an 8D. By the way, I think they're, they've got a tape here they're going to run off tonight. They, the, the, the serenade? Yeah. Or some playing. I mean, uh, does that sound like the typical AD in a rain barrel? <laughs> That's really brilliant. <laughs> Sparkling playing. Now, he doesn't play on a small mouthpiece, but it is definitely not one of those Cardinelli jobs. You know, it's a, it's a normal, old-fashioned mouthpiece, and he's really controlling it. He's making it play the way he wants it to. Who? Right? Bring around. I, mean, I, I think that uh, sensational <laughs> spectacle of what that's what a you know what a really good player can do with that instrument. I don't think it's, it's designed to play that way. I mean, he's making the instrument do something it's not really meant to do. But I think it's a, a, I don't think the whole story is his mouthpiece, but it's a good bit of it would be in the mouthpiece. I think you have to have control of the instrument somewhere. That's really remarkable. Then turn them out. What does that mouthpiece do for you? Well, it, it inhibits me a little bit because it, it, the cross cut is a little smaller. I'm, I'm playing a little bit wider. I can, if I lost this, I'd just pick that right up and, and start playing on it. I mean, I it doesn't. It just, I'm just a little cramped with it. But this is a, a very standard crosscut. That's a little bit, in spite of the dirt, a little bit larger. But I, I wouldn't have any doubt that I could play this mouthpiece in three days. Very easily, yeah. What is the problem with basic For me, uh, I mean, for a lot of students, I think it's too cupped. It's slightly cupped in there. This is very straight. Maybe, I don't know if you had a chance to look at it very straight and I think the fire pit has a little cut in the bottom and I don't I think the rim is too vague it's too marshmallowy it's too it's too broad and too soft it's too rounded I think you need a delineation for sensitivity I and mean, to, to, to locate to relocate a tone you need a little more a little more exact it's too much like putting a mitten on your mouth <laughs> Oh, I think it's both. I think it's both. I mean, the uh, mm -hmm. I think it's a very rounded, a very rounded rim on both external and internal edges. Now, how about, for example, Geyer, for instance, would take a fireplace mouthpiece if he were going to copy one. He'd, he'd fool around with it with his micrometer, which is his little finger. <laughs> very good one, by the way. And uh, he'd finally he'd, he'd, keep, he'd look at you. He'd ask you to play a few things, and finally he'd, he'd say, "Here, this is this is for you. This is a this is a copy." And you'd say, "Gee, that's great," and you'd, you'd, and you'd like it. But when you got back home, you'd say, "You know, that inside edge is a little sharper than that." And he would he wouldn't he wouldn't be satisfied. He'd put a little edge, not a sharp one, just a little more edge on the inside. He'd leave the rest of it exactly the same. Well, this gets down to the personal problem. My problem with amateur wise has always been uh, the small amount. I have trouble getting enough uh, the end of the mouth. And I fooled around with Gardenelli. And with that mm -hmm. DC too, which I suspect, by the way, the top is one of the smaller Gardenelli. I doubt that, but I don't think I don't think Giardinelli has a backboard that's anywhere in his shop that looks like this. Uh, I'm talking about the rim. Oh, the rim might be. Yeah. It might be. The well, cross cut. Did you mean the ball? No, the well, I mean the diameter at the top. That's what I think it's yeah. called. Cross cut. The inner diameter at the top. Like 
but what he literally called. Well, the Jordanelli is quite small, isn't it? Across there. Well, some of them are. There's a boy down there at Florida who's playing on a Jardinelli that's bigger than this. There are 25 of them. Yeah, there's many that there are numbers. <laughs> well, I don't... Uh, so you feel you feel that this mouthpiece, for example, is, is too I, small? Uh, I feel the case of the Jardinelli is probably it's too broad. It is too too broad across yeah. too much space. Well, it, this is smaller than the Jardinelli, or than some of the Jardinelli that I've seen. But I'm wondering if, if perhaps the people with small lips are... Well, I don't, I mean, standing here, I don't see that you're any different than anybody else, you know? I mean, I don't know what, do you mean thin? Yeah. From floor to ass? Or do you mean from corner to corner? Which? Both? Well, I, I don't. I don't really think. I don't really think that. I don't really think that's the important fact. I mean, I think that if you can get your upper lip to touch your lower lip, you can fly corn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, this is certainly away from the subject, and maybe not ready to too much to do this, but uh, most of your playing has the chamber music. Well, no, not really. I mean, I've done a lot of that, but I've done a lot of. I mean, I played the Minneapolis Symphony. You know, a lot of the fly by night, you know, Bridgeport, Hartford, New Haven, San Diego, you know, all that sort of minor league stuff. And in New York, I did everything from, from Gangbusters to Mitch Miller to Costellano to Bruno Walter and back again. I mean, most of my playing in New York was commercial flying. Well, I, well I'm I'm saying, is, is, uh, I think somebody broached on this subject this morning, uh, I mean, touched on it rather. Uh, uh, concerning your playing in quintet as opposed to mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. what, what you're saying is essentially that you just change the interpretation of a volume marking or something, but it's also, and this is again in conjunction with it, you would think in terms of the horn that you pick uh, in playing, like, did you play a guy or a Schmidt? I played Schmidt, Schmidt. Yeah. Schmidt. Uh, when you play quintet as opposed to something like play the same horn and the same mouthpiece. Well, does this response a great deal like this shit? Pretty much. It's a very free-blowing horn, and it's got a lot of things, a lot of qualities that Schmidt doesn't have. It's a much better scale, much more accurate, much even. It's a few things. I mean, it, has, it lacks a certain individuality. And I had a very good, a rare Schmidt, you know, really remarkably good one. Well, I played this for the years, too. I, I was curious about what the, there are a lot of Con AD users mm -hmm. here, and they're just probably going to be curious as to why you don't have Well, I don't like the Con because I think it's a, I think it's a delusion. I think it's a, I think you can turn yourself on with a Con AD very easily, and you can play, and the guy sitting next to second way is deluge with that. You know, it's tremendous. And, and it has great psychological value. And you know you you think you're good, then you're good. So it's not without value. But when you get out front, very often you find that the con AD isn't making it. It isn't getting out front. It isn't. Uh, there's an awful lot of sound going on. But like, where is it? You hear somebody mumble, mumble, mumble. What? What? I'm not getting the message. I don't hear delineation. I don't hear pitch. Be very exact. I find I worked in New York, played first horn, and I played second horn and third and fourth, and everything else. Stayed all the same money, so it doesn't matter. So you stick, you, 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 you're playing second, your job is to play with whoever's playing first. And I find with good players playing first, my biggest problem was to play just octaves and fifths with an HD on first horn. I never, I, I'm playing an octave on this is my note. <coughs> well, that's where I think it is, according to what I hear in the orchestra. But I'm going like, ah, oh, I didn't know. I go, and it doesn't make any difference. I mean, I don't, I don't get any, I don't hook into anything. I can't latch into an octave. And yet, I know this guy is playing the tune. I can't find it. I don't hear it. It's just, <laughs> There's a sound. It's a big woolly sound. Somewhere in there is a the center. I don't hear the sound. I don't get it. I don't get it. That's why, that's why Reynolds, for instance, is an uh, unusual player for me on an AC. That he has this fiber and this, I don't mean vibrato, this intensity, focus. See, I think, I think a tone is 
I think a tone can be reduced to a very small little thing. And you would say, there's a tone. And, you know, and here it is a tone. I mean, this tone is not very good, but it's about as good as I'm going to get today. It has at least some kind of a center, and it has a little padding around the edge, and it's, it's quite soft. Now, if I want that to be louder, I just turn on a little more steam, and it grows. And as it grows, it maintains the center. That's the main thing I want. But it doesn't get... A Connie D tends to sound like a bass trying to sing a tenor out of it has a bass quality, and I think the horn is a tenor. Uh, I want to use your held in tenor, and it sounds like a dark teacher. I want a very good horn. Anyway, it has that heroic tenor quality. And when you play... That should sound high. It should sound, you know, a little better. It should, it should you know... It should sound like uh, Bjorling, it should sound like Caruso, it should sound like a tenor. It shouldn't sound that way. You know? It shouldn't have that, that uh, Melchior quality. It should have vibrance. That has, again, nothing to do with vibrato. But it has intensity. And that's what, to me, in the hands of the average player, the Con AD does not have. Now, you put, you put a Giardinelli or typical, you know, comparable mouthpiece into one of those horns, and you're in even more trouble. I mean, it's, you, you, you've got less focus, it's less, con less concentration. I don't say it can't be played well, I just think that it's unnecessary. And then, on the other hand, to play softly, to play chamber music, to play quintets or, or something of this sort, you really, you're really in a disaster area. You're really fighting the instrument to play it delicately. Now, a horn like this, or a Geiger, or any one of the so-called small horns, as they're quaintly called now, uh, <laughs> I'll tell you one thing. Nobody, no conductor ever had to do this more than once. And nobody ever said, you know, can't hear the horn. Nobody ever, if they said it, then they got what they were looking for. I mean, I never, on recording, in recording context, or in halls, or, I've never been unable to satisfy a conductor, any conductor about volume, I've been unable to satisfy them about other things. <laughs> but, no, I, and that's, I've, and I've played all my life on small horns, with small mouthpieces. I mean, Bruno Yannicki was another one, you know, he played on a small Alexander with a small mouthpiece. Man, you couldn't, you couldn't, you can't imagine the way that kind of would fill kind of you. I mean, fill it like to the corners, it would be pushing out under the door. When you play Samaramity, or when you play, you know, the simplest little old pop concert song, it was so intense that you you wanted to you could you wanted to escape from it. It just was everywhere, but it was always you could always tell where it was coming from. It wasn't an emanation, but it was it was a manifestation. You know, there, yes. Along with that, the really most beautiful instrument that playing on those recordings that you played from New York, not just the horn, but everybody else. No, not a bit. Uh, I can't remember if all of them were made stereo. I think the first ones were not, but they were mostly made in stereo. They were made seated, except for the very first one we made, Hindemith and Don E minor. Except for that one, all the subsequent recordings were made in the same room, but on the stage of a like a Masonic ballroom. A stage probably as big as this and half of it in a little shell with a fair amount of curtains, but a live stage playing to an empty hall with two mics <coughs> hanging about, seated, seated in exact concert position, just horn and back, clarinet, bassoon, horn, oboe, flute. Naturally, the flute was closer to the mic than I was. But the, the mics were probably, as we sat, probably four feet above our head and about six feet out from the flute. In other words, like off the edge of the stage. But that would be, and that's where they stayed. They were never moved or touched. And that was how we made all those recordings. They were all made in concert 
seated seating position and no no micing tricks at all. I would roll across the stage to get the widest possible uh, distance between the reflecting surface, uh, surface and the bell or the horn. Or do you well, no, I sat looking straight out. In other words, I was looking right at the two microphones, so I was sort of angling. I noticed you played both high and low on both the F and the D. Like, mm -hmm. Would you describe your system? I have no system at all. <laughs> I, I play a mostly D flat horn because I was born that way. I, started playing baritone, I grew up playing a great deal by ear, and uh, so I just think in terms of D quite a lot easier than F. But I practice a great deal of F horn, and and like to, just as a challenge, play to all the way through an F horn, or all the way through a B flat horn, or play gay or arpeggio passages all the way, one way or the other. I, would, I like to feel, like to feel that I know both horns completely. And I don't think I ever play anything twice the same. Well, help me. Uh, I mean, <laughs> no, I mean, I just don't like to be tied down, but I've got to go. Do I have to do that? Do well, I, get a, uh, I think we have the same picture. Yeah. And uh, his entire career, I didn't understand it was on a single. Alexander cut down. Well, it, was, it ended up being a B-flat horn. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I... Found out how much easier it was to get the job done to be one of the for 20 years. Uh, although I, I had a couple of uh, nine times this time I was playing with this class. So I went to uh, Bob Lowe and Helberby this year on an occasional basis and, 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 and it helped me. And uh, he said, well, the first thing I do is to get, get off the uh, B flat horn below the written G sharp. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you go to the third, you accept his advice or you get another teacher. Uh, yes, it just sounds different regardless. No, I don't. I think, I just think you should know the horn all over the place. I mean, it, it, it's, it's just, it's like, it's a little too arbitrary for me. It's like saying that George Dell tells me I've got to play an AP. I won't play an AP. If he tells me I've got to, I'll be darn sure I won't. I won't do anything anybody tells me I have to do. And, I mean, I'll try anything because I'm interested, but I don't like to be told that I have to do something. I don't like to be arbitrarily told that I, below G sharp, I should play F on. Uh, it's like saying, well, you play up the skip piano and you see that keyhole, okay, so change hands, and from here on you play with the right hand. You go up to, to, to C sharp on the G string, you've got to cross to the D string. Maybe you feel like that today, but maybe tomorrow you want to go further up on the G string on the violin. I mean, why not? I mean, you know, I, I, I like to feel free according to the way the hall feels, the way my lip feels, the way the horn feels today. Sometimes the F horn sounds unbelievable so bad. I will play a note on the F horn someday. And other days I'll play whole passages on the F horn that I never even thought of playing. You've got very much the same reaction. Uh, yeah. But I mean, I think I think we should look for ways to free ourselves. I mean, the instrument is only a, a means to make music, and the more ways you can find to play it, the more ways you find to make music. I mean, this note means one thing. This is another. I play. I'll play that note that way. Brahms trio. Because it's a different color, and there's a whole magical thing going on the piano there. I don't think it's the question of playing the right note. It's a question of what feels right. And if that feels right at that moment, then do it. But don't don't be obliged to tell me that I have to play that open on the F horn, or that I can't play it on the B flat horn, or that I can't play it on the D horn. You know, it seems it seems to me that we sometimes allow that we allow these techniques. And they are techniques, and they're important, and they're important to discuss. So we allow them to tell us what we're supposed to do. And what we're supposed to do is to try to, to experience the music, and through that experience, to communicate to other people. Now I can say all you do is get all of your fellows play magnificently, and not one time go through a on 
So how you're getting the job done? Is maybe that's maybe fine. that's a very significant thing. It probably is. Actually. I mean, the fact that we don't agree. I mean, it doesn't mean that we're fighting either. No. But I, I think the fact that we don't agree might be a clue to, to what I'm just saying. Yeah. Like explore, find some new way for yourself. But at least don't. I don't mean to say you shouldn't accept. I mean, I know Bob Elworthy, and I think he's a great guy and a wonderful player. And if I were studying with him, I certainly would do what he said. And I would accept it willingly and graciously and gratefully. And I would then later, as I do studying, all right, I would take what I could. I'd take what I could, and I might be that. But it's then studying with someone else and taking a t- completely different point. You never hard knows about it. No, you but know, I mean, all right. You so always preface by saying I would. Yeah. Uh, for me, that works, uh, and so on. Yeah. Uh, in terms of the thing rings, I, I wonder, if you indicate this, or would you feel this is a, a paucity of technique uh, or information that in some areas, uh, in stopping a horn, I find, in order to get better information, I'm actually writing out thing rings that I find on the instrument and reading those instead of the notes because I can't always depend on having a half step, uh, you know, thing ring, half step lower. Uh, to get the notes or have stuff higher. Uh, do, you, do you do this a good deal? Well, I, have, uh, I haven't had any occasion to get caught in stop horn, but I think if I got into some real problematic passages, I might have to do it with this horn. I find this horn, for my hand, very hard to stop successfully. Uh, I, don't, I, I never had any trouble before on the Schmidt, it was easy, and on a Christie, which I played before. This, the range, right? I found I, on the Christie particularly I could play stop torn from one end of the horn to the other, just according to the book, you know, half step all the way. This thing I would have to I would have to sit down and do what I tell my students to do, write out a chart for yourself, a fingering chart. Because your hand and this bell with this mouthpiece and the way you play, there are four factors that will decide what the best fingering for that note is, and you just have to find your own. And it's all very well to say, well, it was a half step this way or a half step that way, but you you have obviously find out obviously found out that that doesn't apply in every case, and you've got to make up fingers. I would say, you know, optimistically, that what you should do, having learned all this, is to sit down and you know spend a week some summer practicing stop torn etudes till you can memorize at least through the center of the range what your freaky fingerings are. Because I, I think you know I, I do think. <laughs> I'm almost afraid that someone else is going to come on and look at a piece of music that I've, in which I've marked a lot of fingerings. I think how embarrassed that'd be. But that goes me to practice. Well, Farkas mentioned that familiar with the Korsakoff solo. The horn call is the music or stop with you know, the capricio. And, you know, and um, I have never been able to play the bottom note. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure how great determination of lip and ear working in conjunction to play. I mean, I think you, 80% of most of the stop notes, particularly when you get off the end of the staff down, you're just making them up by sheer willpower. You know, it's just brute force and awkwardness, you know. <laughs> it's really, they, they don't lie gracefully in most arms. So I, I don't, I think, but I think you, you're, you're on the right track in that you, you really have to figure out your own horn for yourself. I mean, it's inconceivable that, that, that a small 14-year-old girl playing an 8D, let's say, be able to stop the horn. <clears throat> Not that she would be able to stop the horn, but that she would stop the horn the same way I would or the same way someone with a still bigger hand would. So, I mean, and, and that we would all be able to use the same fingering. This is ludicrous. I mean, this can't possibly be. I mean, there's a, there, there's... You know, the, horn, the hand has to go in so far to stop the horn. Well, in some cases it's going to be a lot farther in than others. So, practice horses.